Yeah. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Great Trees and Women's Temple. This morning we have two wonderful speakers. Uh, but first, Tejo, would you start the uh, open utra? An unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect dharma is rarely met with even in a hundred thousand million kalpas. Having it to see and listen to, remember and accept, I vow to taste the truth of the Tathagata's teaching. Now, brief statement on Dana. In Buddhism, when Zen practitioners share their understanding of the teachings and practice, it is offered freely as a practice of Dana Paramita. Dana is a Pali word that means generosity to give freely. And this practice is done with that expectation of getting something in return. This is the spirit of speaking about the Dharma. Other ways to practice thus to offer support to those who share the teaching, to support places of spiritual practice, and to give without judgment or expectation when opportunity arises. Those who share the teachings at Great Tree do so on a Dana basis. Please support their practice by giving what you can. Um, and Dana should go to Great Tree this morning. Susan? Yes. Okay. And please go to greattreetemple.org and follow the donate path. <sighs> Our talk this morning is The Wisdom of Desire, a conversation between Susan Lamb and Rare Tejo of Munich. Susan holds PhD degree PhD degree in clinical psychology from Vanderbilt University. She was a psychotherapist for more than 36 years, working with individuals and couples. For more than two decades, the topic of desire on the life's path has been a focus of her exploration and practice. She has drawn from her own experiences and those of clients and friends, as well as from psychological concepts to distill understand and understandings on the topic. Teachings from several wisdom traditions have guided the process. Since Tejo started leading meditation retreats in Savannah in the 1990s, Susan has come to opportunities to practice with and learn from her. She has been a great tree supporter since the beginning. She also studied and practiced with Sally Kempton in the Kashmir Shivite tradition of in the final days of Sally's life. Susan developed chanting has led devotional chanting and meditation workshops in her community. Her Sangha of Savannah is a group of associates of the Sister St. Joseph. Reverend Tejo Munich, the abbess and founder of Great Trees and Women Temple. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. I will, I will start us out perhaps with an apology for that bio being too long. If there is a, another opportunity for me to have a conversation here, we'll shorten it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here and to, to be in conversation with Tejo, which is always a, a blessing. Um, Tejo and I met over three decades ago when um, the minister at Unity Church here came to me and said, would you um, like to be in charge of a meditation workshop um, with a Zen teacher named Tejo? And I said, sure, <laughs> why not? Tejo had a, a, a friend that she'd practiced with at San Francisco Zen Center, who was at, um, lived on Tybee Island near Savannah. And she wanted Tejo to visit. And the only way to get her here was to have her lead a meditation workshop. <laughs> so Tejo came and it was my first exposure to Zen, and I I kept expecting Tejo to tell us what to do, and of course she never did. <laughs> but even then, so long ago, Tejo's um, her practice and her no nonsense approach came through particularly when people would ask her questions. 
So I have been a, a follower ever since and have watched her follow her desire to start a Zen temple for women. And that has been a great learning experience. So that's how we met. And then Tejo, did you have something you wanted to say? I think you pretty much covered it. Kathy, um, my friend from actually from Tassajara, uh, who was from near Savannah, she grew up near Savannah. And she um, was absolutely convinced that Susan and I were soulmates because she just said we were so much alike. So I, of course, didn't believe her. You know, it's like a blind date. <laughs> <laughs> you're like oh no that won't work <laughs> but anyway it turns out that we have been like that you know we really somehow we've got a connection we follow different spiritual paths but they're in the same you know kind of vein but anyway uh susan's been thinking about <laughs> yeah susan's been thinking about desire for a long time and I'm more of an amateur when it comes to the study of desire or whatever amateur or beginner. And, and so uh, I'm going to let you uh, take it over, Susan, because you can come at it from just about any direction. Okay. So um, Tejo and I had a conversation a month or so ago about about desire once again. And in that conversation, we were talking about the, um, the biggest problem that we all have with desire, which is that we get attached to what we want. And that tends to paralyze us. It tends to shut other people out. Of, um, being involved with the vision because theirs won't be exactly like what we're grasping onto. And Tejo said, <clears throat> that's what happens to her as it does to all of us. And she said, you know, there may be some people who are so enlightened that that doesn't happen to them but it happens to me and of course it happens to me and probably to all of us and so then i told her this story that appears in the mythology of the hindu tradition the story of ganesha the elephant god we've probably all seen the statues and the pictures of the elephant god who is the overcomer of obstacles interestingly um and he also, he was the scribe for the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. He supposedly wrote it all down. And he made a statement at the very beginning when he was writing it down. He said, on the first day of my life, I made a mistake, an error. And since that day, have I followed that path to wisdom? I remember I was, I was in a laundromat drying clothes because something was wrong with our dryer when I read that. And, you know, that sort of snaps you to attention. I made a mistake. And since that day, have I followed that path to wisdom? Because we all make mistakes, but we don't tend to think, oh, this is on my path to wisdom. So this is where that statement comes from. Um, he was created by his mother Parvati uh, by herself uh, from the dew of her forehead. And she created him to, to keep out intruders. She liked to take long soaking baths and meditate in the bath. And people were always intruding and she had hired bodyguards, but nothing really worked. And so she created the sun to keep intruders away. And one of the first intruders he shut out 
was uh, Parvati's husband, as it turns out, uh, Shiva, who'd been away fighting demons. And he came back um, and Ganesh said, oh no, you can't go in. My mother has told me to keep everybody away. And Ganesh, in addition to be, being the great God of consciousness is also a great warrior God. So he just immediately cut off Ganesh's head and proceeded in to see his wife. And Parvati, of course, when she found out was pretty horrified and angry. So he rushed out and he found uh, the first creature he saw and it was an elephant. And he cut off the elephant's head and attached it to Ganesha's neck. And that's how he became the elephant god. So I, I became interested in that story and the path of error to wisdom um, because depression seems to me a state of desirelessness. And so it's like, that is an error. You know, there are lots of reasons to be concerned about desire and lots of errors that we make on the path of desire. But to have no desires is, creates a state of, uh, malaise, which as a, a psychotherapist, you know, you spend your time with people in psychotherapy, the people who are depressed, looking for what are the desires that have been cut off. So this is one of the errors we can make, the error of being overly attached to our desires is the opposite side of that coin. So that's how we get the, that path of error leading us to wisdom. So Tejo, knowing that this is a conversation, time for me to let go. Well, one of the things that just came up is that depression, if depression is no desires, it's sort of a uh, an attachment to no desires. Mm. I like that. Yeah. And the, 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 and, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say the more we talk about the problems with depression with um, desire the more we see that it is attachment to desires. And I had never thought about what you just said, that depression can be an attachment to no desires. You know, it's sort of like fear-based. You know, it's, it's a, we're afraid to do anything because it might, we might fail or something, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, I, um, no, I think I think you're right. There was there was something that I, you know, when we first started talking about this last month about having this conversation, I I did you know I don't know I was kind of googling around and thinking about things and, um, I I uh, I wrote down some things I don't know where I got them from but I think maybe this actually might have even been something you said. I had it up a little while ago and now I'm looking for it. Um, but anyway, it was talking about desire as a progression. Oh, and yeah. That really kind of, maybe it was you that was talking about that because I was transcribing as you were talking. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So <clears throat> I saw, I know I was. <laughs> as you've heard, I've been working on this topic for a long time. And quite a while ago, I was visiting my mom in Alabama and I guess my sister brought a, a video of 
the world religion scholar Houston Smith talking with Bill Moyers about um, Zen, a Zen view of, of desire and what, what it is that we humans desire. And he didn't actually call it a progression, but it pretty clearly is when you hear what he named. Um, starts out with with pleasure that you know we all desire pleasure and especially in childhood we're we're looking for pleasure and pretty good at at finding it and then that morphs into the desire for success and then the next thing on his list was responsibility. And, you know, I, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is the kind of responsibility that goes with success, that um, if you're successful in your business, you take on more and more. If you're successful in your academic career, you have um, more and more responsibilities. Um, but I knew from having studied pleasure as a desire that that pleasure and success both, um, they're fairly sh short-lived. Um, they say that, I love this. Uh, when when they have looked at people who have won the lottery and people who have had accidents and become paraplegic, that of course at first the people who have won the lottery are very very happy, and the people who have become paraplegic are very unhappy. But over the course of time, the people go back to their previous level of happiness. So it's like, we're about as happy as we know how to be. And the same is true of getting a raise or getting more responsibilities that at first you're very happy, but then over time that fades. So I knew that responsibility on that progression was probably not that kind of responsibility, that it was more like the ability to respond, that to be able to respond without being bound by um, sort of automatic reactions is a, a more advanced desire. And then finally, the desire for liberation. And, and how we move on that progression is pretty interesting. You know, you could, you could sort of call that an error path because <clears throat> it's like we follow that desire for pleasure until we learn that the pleasure of a bowl of ice cream lasts as well, probably not even as long as you're eating the whole bowl of ice cream. The first few bites are the ones that really have pleasure in them. Um, the pleasure of watching a movie is over pretty much as soon as the movie's over. Um, so you start looking for something that's longer lasting. And success is probably longer lasting than those first three bites of ice cream, <laughs> but it does have its limits. And so as we discover that, oh, I remember my, my roommate in college told me I would go away on a, a weekend that was highly anticipated and supposed to be lots of fun. And I would come back and she's, how was it? And I'd say, well, it was good. It wasn't as good as I thought it would be. Which, you know, I mean, partly that's me 
but partly, or that was me, partly that is human nature. That sometimes I think desire itself as an energy may be more pleasurable than most of the things that we desire. So it's like it's the anticipation that is so delightful. Of course, as we learn to savor things, like um, Martin Seligman, who studied happiness a lot and teaches people to, you know, okay, take those first three bites of ice cream and then wait a little while before you, before you eat any more so that the sensory app apparatus is not habituated. Um, talk about your pleasurable experiences with people to savor them. Have a gratitude practice so that you yourself are savoring. Um, and then, you know, there's not as much to say off the cuff, I guess, about responsibility and liberation. Well, Tejo was saying yesterday, I guess when we have experiences of freedom and then we grasp at them, <laughs> trying to do exactly the same things that brought us to that experience last time, it's not very free anymore. So I guess that's one thing we can say about liberation that we we try to grasp at that too. Okay, what do you think, Tejo? Well, I guess I was thinking of the progression a little bit differently uh, because, especially because I've been thinking about the cycle of the interdependent co-arising. I'm going mm -hmm. to. Uh, Put this up on the screen if I can find the screen share. There it is. I have Randall make me a chart. Just a second. View. There it is. Okay, so this is um, not the usual one that we see. It's usually a 12, 12 fold chain of causation, it's caused, it's called. This is the early one that um, that uh, came from the Sutta Nipata, one of the early sutras. And it talks about, now this, this is a kind of, I think the opposite, you're talking about it leading to liberation. Um, and that, you know, probably if we were talking about letting go yesterday, that's where that comes from because this is the cycle that leads to suffering. Uh, and, you know, the clinging comes. Uh, we perceive something and along with our perception is probably a result. Uh, it may not be the result that actually happens, but we usually have something that we're going for that our perception brings about. And it causes us to, to make contact and contact means sense contact so um that contact when we have contact with something through our senses through the object of our senses it um immediately causes attachment and, and i've talked about this before because shohaku talks about it in one of the things i transcribed of his and he was talking about how um if you look at if, if he looks at a dic dictionary page, just kind of sees the page, there's no attachment there. But if he no notices one word and kind of hones in on that one word, immediately there's an attachment. And, you know, I've not I, I kind of, I kind of thought that was a really, it kind of boggled my mind at first when I heard it, because I thought, wow, that happens fast. But I have noticed in my life when I lose something that I realize all the ways that I had attached to it that I hadn't been noticing along the way. 
So that at any rate, even if it doesn't happen fast, it happens before we notice it. So the sensation, whatever it is, we like something or we don't like something, it causes us some sort of preference or it causes us some sort of attachment, attachment to uh, keeping something or attachment to pushing something away. And that attachment um, immediately, you know, we have a preference and that preference is what leads to suffering, which takes us back into that cycle, which is the cycle of grasping. So that's what I was thinking about when I was thinking about how um, how uh, desire, you know, because really desire comes about at, at the point of perception, and and the other opposite of of uh, the cycle that brings us back into suffering is what Susan was talking about, which is the letting go uh, that comes about um, through, you know, like she was talking about it, when you get to the point of success, you don't attach to that success. Is that what you were saying? But rather you, 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 um, become aware of how you can respond um, yeah I think um, being bound by habitual reactions yeah and that's letting go once, once there's success and you know for some people it's pretty rapid for others it may take many decades but that eventually one realizes that that in itself is not um, not bringing the kind of happiness that you imagined that it would, that there's always the need for more. Mm. And so, so one may decide that even though they're involved in those activities that are successful, that this movement toward genuine ability to respond and movement toward liberation is something that um, that there's a longing for. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's that recognition is the breaking of that cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That recognition and that that awareness and that ability to respond mm -hmm. to things as they are, not to the, the outcome that we perceived mm -hmm. or not through our habitual responses. Does that make sense? It does to me. And, and this whole idea, which seems... Um, well, it's deceptively simple, this idea of letting go. <laughs> um, but it is, it can be very difficult to do. And it provides incredible relief when we do it. It helps us let go of what, what I experience as a kind of paralysis around trying to make something happen. Which is, which is attachment. It's a desire and it's attachment to desire, really. Yeah. But you know, this idea um, that comes from Ganesh of uh, recognizing that the uh, mistake is the path to wisdom. <laughs> I think that that's sort of that, that moment of recognition when we realize that um, what we perceive to be a failure because it didn't turn out the way we expected 
is actually an opportunity to kind of expand our understanding of what the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is a moment of letting go. Of course, sometimes we're so attached to our idea of perception of uh, perfection that um, we the ego keeps grasping if like if only I hadn't done this, if only I had done that, so that once again we're we're grasping and and missing this opportunity mm -hmm. or for that blessed letting go. Yeah. You listed the other day when we were talking, and unfortunately, I don't have it on this computer. You listed about four different ways that you thought we made mistakes. <laughs> Four different kinds of mistakes. The kinds of errors. Er yeah, four kinds of errors, right. So, of course, the big one is um, attachment. And, and then there is mistaking the particular vision we have for the larger desire or intention i know when when i talked about desire before with great tree we talked about how i i like to use the metaphors from monsters incorporated that old animated movie that in in that movie you have um monsters there's a a closet, you know, every child's room has a closet and the back door of the closet goes to the utility company. The front door of the closet goes to the child's room. And somehow the metaphor that has appeared for me is that the utility company is sort of the highest wisdom that we can um, arrive at at a given moment, the children's room and the sleeping children, awakening children are um, our, our ideas of, of what it is that we desire. And they can be pretty naive. Um, so to actually have two-way conversations from the closet. I think of the closet as sort of the closet of mindful awareness. And so when we're looking at desires, we can look in both directions. Like, okay, what is it that my naive self believes I want and need? And then let me look over here at the utility company at my wisest self that I can access. And what, what is the highest good for all with regard to this? What is, um, what is the highest good for me? Um, and often the particular vision and the highest good are not a particularly good match. And so a lot of our work with desire is seeking to bring those together so one of the errors that we make is not not submitting the naive desires to the utility company to our highest wisdom um sometimes i think a way to get at that higher wisdom is is asking what is the state of being that I think this desire will bring me to. And, and often there is, a, there is some real wisdom there because it's, um, there's a kind of joy, a kind of collaboration, a kind of community of loving and being loved 
that are the deeper intention of this wiser self. So missing out on that, just listening to the awakening children is an error. Um, and then either giving up on our desires or continuing to stay with something that was our big desire long past the point where it is really bringing the kind of satisfaction that we imagined and maybe the kind of satisfaction that it, that it did bring. Um, one of the, you know, we were also talking about how there's a succession of desires over the lifetime where eventually, well, Carl Jung said, we spend the first half of our lives becoming somebody or trying to become somebody and the last part of our lives letting that go. And that that happens naturally, but if we're still trying to hold on to what we created, that's, that's an error. So I don't know if that was four or not. They would all kind of bleed together. <laughs> well, I, I think that probably, and you said this, and I, and I also had this in my notes, uh, is this idea that we, um, just a second that we, um, I don't have it up here now, but just a second, that what we want is a kind of a, a state of being. What we want is happiness. And, and that kind of made me realize, it, 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 first of all, it brought up uh, a question I asked Katagiri Roshi one time at a tea at our monastery. And I said, uh, I had just come back from Japan and my teacher at Japan kept talking about ego this and ego that. So I asked Katagiri Roshi, what, what is ego? And I expected him to say, you know, oh, it's this thing that really is terrible and it dominates us and everything. And he said, ego is our life force. And, you know, I, I he said, we, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have any will to live if we didn't have ego. And I think I was thinking about desire in this way that, um, there's sort of a thread of desire that kind of goes through our life. And, and it's mentioned in the Metta Sutta that uh, every all beings want to be happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, uh, so we're kind of seeking this, this state of happiness, but our, our discriminating mind is always kind of saying, well, that's what you're feeling is not enough. <laughs> you, know? you need something more. Uh, and it needs more exciting and it needs to be constantly exciting or constantly not exciting or, or something. You know, we have all these definitions of how so things should you, you also mentioned, Tejo, just bodhicitta, which mm -hmm. is in itself a kind of natural desire that we have that draws us forward on our spiritual path there is that desire for liberation for a lasting joy that goes beyond just happiness in this moment because something good happened and sadness because something bad happened so i i want to wonder sometimes if if many of our desires are there really are misinterpretation of the bodhicitta desire. I think they're grasping at what bodhicitta offers to us, which is that experience of letting go. You know, I taught when I talk about bodhicitta, it's I remind I'm always reminded of something my teacher in Japan said, and he said that most of us came to this practice because of some crisis in our lives, some, something that, you know, didn't work out the way we expected, or, you know, some kind of sense of failure or something. And so I was thinking about bodhicitta, and bodhi, bodhicitta actually means uh, awakened mind. 
it's often called the, the way-seeking mind because it's said that bodhicitta is this awakening that brought us to the practice, you know, to maybe to try and keep awakening, you know. Uh, and you can see that that's the seed of attachment right there. But uh, so we go to a practice and, you know, I can't tell you how much I've come across this in the Zen world of people wanting you to tell them what to do. And you mentioned that earlier. And I, I remember one of my roommates, a really smart woman, uh, from, she was from California, and she persuaded uh, the Roshi there to ordain her. He had never ordained an American woman before. Uh, and he, you know, he told her to go to America and find a teacher, but she said, no, 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 you're my teacher. And so he ordained her. And one day he just, he was one of these people. He wasn't like Katagiri Roshi, who was just really sweet and nice to talk to. But this guy was like, tell me what you're thinking right now. <laughs> and she said, why don't you tell me what to do? And she said, as soon as she said that, she just was like, really did I say that because she cut she was a very independent kind of person and I said you know Diane Diane son we all want that we all come to this wanting something and, and you know even though it's bodhicitta and that letting go that brought us here and that's the thing that we really want to we we that brings us right to the heart of what life is because when we let go everything is there um we still somehow our mind keeps wanting to even grasp onto the experience of letting go, which as you can see, just from thinking about it, it is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, when you make a statement like grasping onto the experience of letting go, I mean, there's so wonderfully, it is so wonderfully amusing that that that's, who we are and what we do it helps you let go right right even recognizing our state of mind you know um there's this chant that we did at the at the big um preset ceremony out in la and it's basically it's the, i think it's the first chapter of the lotus sutra and it's about avalokita who is the bodhisattva of compassion and it just goes into all these things even if monsters come and they want to gobble you up you know just call the name of Avalokiteshvara and Avalokiteshvara will be there to save you you know and it it just had such an impact on me when I was reading it I've read it before and thought it was kind of crazy but for some reason doing it within this ritualistic ceremony it just woke me up and I, I realized that when I do that, uh, even having the image of Kuan Yin or Avalokiteshvara, I, it breaks me. It, it, first of all, I have to be aware that I'm in a state of mind where I need to call out for something, you know, where I need to make a shift. <laughs> and I think just that acknowledgement, uh, you know, you can use any kind of image. But just that acknowledgement is a letting go. And that's what we do in zazen. That's yeah. what we do when we sit down and shut up. So as you were talking, I was thinking about how that grasping mind, which I guess maybe sometimes we call ego, can, it can try to co-opt anything. You know, it can have whatever experience of letting go. And then, you know, it's like something in us says, oh, it's happening, I'm being enlightened, or um, this is an excuse. What did I do to make that happen? <laughs> what did I do to make that happen so that, that I can make it happen again? That's right. <laughs> and maybe I can even help other people make it happen. Yeah, right. By telling them what to do. <laughs> right. So you've got that. It, it's always looming there. But you also have always looming there Avalokiteshvara or your angels or Jesus or whatever it is that that is the energy of letting go. Mm -hmm. I 
realized that one time, and we should probably uh, stop pretty soon and ask for some discussion. But uh, when I was at the Minnesota Zen Center, one time I lost my car keys. And, um, you know, I was in one of these mental states, like, I lost my car keys, I've got to find my car keys. And I was looking all over for them. And all of a sudden I thought, well, I'm going to ask St. Anthony, <laughs> you know, because that goes back to my Catholic thing, mm -hmm. even though St. Anthony isn't really a saint anymore. But anyway, I asked St. Anthony, with, within a few minutes, I found my car keys. And I thought, what was it? What is it about that? You know, because I don't even believe in St. Anthony anymore, right? But there, there is a letting go that happens when you kind of give yourself over to something else. And as soon as you let go, your mind clears and you see what's right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think the same as, same as ask, asking Avalokiteshvara. Uh, only Avalokiteshvara does more than find things for you. <laughs> Oh, that's good. We need a lot more than that. Although that's what we need a lot sometimes. Yeah. So well, should we throw this out? Go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say, let's open it up for discussion. I'm sure there are nine little squares here and, and every little square is full of experiences with desire. Yes. I'm sorry, I have to go, but I have enjoyed listening and learning from from you two very special people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any thoughts? Comments? Anybody ever commit any of these errors? <laughs> yes, Mama. I asked to be off so I can take Mom up. I think she was talking to somebody else. She didn't know oh. me. Okay. Um, I'm just curious too, like what, like when you hear the words, you know, the, the words have their own vibrations, those beautiful words, letting go, um, or, or the image of a God of compassion who helps us let go. I was just interesting in, in whether that, what that conjures for you. You're not talking to me, right? You're talking to everybody. I'm talking to everybody. I, I, kind of, I know a little bit of what it conjures for you. <laughs> just the act of saying it I never realized how important it was. And um, the fact that it, I, I, I sometimes I say it, but I don't let it redirect me. Like yeah. Avalokiteshvara, um, or even, dear God, please, you know, do something, or, or I don't let it go. I still hang on to it afterwards. Um, where I think the word Avalokiteshvara is is interesting is that it takes so long to say, <laughs> you know, and you have to say it right, and it kind of gives you more time to let go. I think, um, but but that's something I'll keep in mind uh, that when I want to ask for help or or when I get to a place where I'm going, I am at the I am at the a place where I don't know what's going on next. I'll try and remember that actually that's my time of letting go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, lo I loved what you said about how 
it takes a while to say it. And it also takes a great deal of concentration to say it. Avalokiteshvara. So you've already moved your mind from your own confusion to that sequence of syllables. I think the thing I like about Avalokiteshvara too is that um, it, it's so kind of esoteric. It's kind of the Avalokiteshvara doesn't have a gender and doesn't have a, you know, you can't really define Avalokiteshvara. You can you can say the Bodhisattva of compassion, but um, compassion is a big, big word, or not just a word, but a big experience, you know, true compassion. And uh, And also Avalokiteshvara has a, 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 like thousands of hands reaching in every direction. Mm -hmm. There's a very beautiful thing on YouTube uh, that, that's done by um, some Chinese women dancers who are incidentally deaf, but it's a dance. And they all st they start out standing in a line and moving their hands in such a way that it looks like one one being with many many hands and then the hands become the thing and each and the hands all have eyes on each finger that's part of the uh, image of Avalokiteshvara it's it's pretty uh, amazing and we've done this in family meditation where we everybody lines up and you know just moves their arms after the first person and of course they all move in a sequence and uh, it feels like um, all beings are one kind of thing mm -hmm. going in many directions. So any other uh, thoughts or, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna ask you, Tejo, you said Avalokiteshvara does much more than find things. Um, so can you tell us a little more about Avalokiteshvara? I'll just keep saying her name, his name. Its name. I call it a she. I mean, because, you know, when it went, when Avalokiteshvara went to China, uh, it became a female um, bodhisattva, which is kind of nice for us women because we don't have too many of them. Hinduism has more of those, <laughs> more women. But um, but I, I mean, I, I just know that Avalokiteshvara is considered the Bodhisattva of compassion, and that compassion for me uh, is is just really the recognition that we're all in this together, <laughs> you know, and that we all have the same challenges and that we all, and, and, you know, to get us out of that discriminating mind, which makes distinctions between me and you and ways how I might be better than you or smarter than you, or how you might be better than me, or, you know, this whole, uh, but compassion to me just means that equalizing, that recognition that we're all equal and we just manifest in different ways and this whole idea of Avalokiteshvara with the many hands reaching in many directions to me it's partly you know compassion is helping others but just that reaching in many directions is kind of reaching out we all are reaching out to each other do you know that it's not it's not a um you know it's not a closed system you know that the image of the great tree is a, a a tree that extends in many directions and nurtures all beings think of it in kind of the same way all those branches so it's not just about me it kind of takes us out of the me that's and, my, and, uh, and the eyes on the fingertips on all these hands are to see each other well, it's yeah it's it's um avalokiteshvara is uh she who hears the cries of the world 
or sees the cries of the world. And I think that's what the eyes are, you know, to extend and experience, mm -hmm. you know. We, we, you know, for us, vision, seeing things is how we relate to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other thoughts? I, I was thinking about how, um, you know, when when there is an image like this and and a word like Avalokiteshvara, that it says so much more than we can actually put into words. That's sort of the whole point of having the image in it, that it, it speaks to us on many, many levels. But I always like to get the words too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm inspired by Lorna's reference to the word letting go. Um, I came in late, so I'm not sure how widespread the use of the term was in the group this morning, but. Um, Letting go, like any of the words that we use, can become a cliche and be, loses effectiveness. And to keep it fresh is the same as the freshness that comes from sitting, um, uh, an effective sitting meditation. That It seems to me that I can't let go any more deeply than I can meditate. The deepest place my meditation can take me is the extent of how I can actually let go of anything. Otherwise, I'm still caught up in that. And the way from getting uncaught or free from being caught is my practice which then when i bring out into activity then i can bring the letting go that worked in the meditation into the letting go of what meets me in the face on the street and so i bring those two together yeah yeah and that you you keep it you keep your experience of the word fresh by continuing to practice, which keeps the practice fresh. Yeah. 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 And we use these words, but you know, it's really like Lee is pointing to, it's really the experience that we keep that we're returning to. And I think also in 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 light of I was thinking this when you were talking, Lorna, and, and you kind of alluded to this too, Susan how um, or we notice it and, and then immediately, but we keep on going, you know, it's like the bell of mindfulness. You can stop and take a breath or you can say, oh, that rang, but I'm gonna keep, I'm not gonna take a breath right now. I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. But I still think that that noticing, there is just this split second of letting go that um, kind of keeps, the fire alive or keeps the keeps the spirit alive in us to go in that direction and i think that that deepens our practice in our everyday life but certainly this is what we experience in meditation you know you're sitting there and, and something comes up and then it comes back and then something comes up and you see it and you you want to let go of it but then you sort of choose not to you choose to ignore it but we see ourselves doing that. And, and each time that we see that, to me, that is a letting go, just the seeing of it. Yeah. But the words make it, a, they make it an easy kind of attachment. <laughs> Having the words. <laughs> Anybody else have a comment or a question? Um, I want to appreciate y'all for talking about this because uh, for me, it's so, it, I can make it so complicated desire. And so y'all talking about it helps um, uh, me look at it in a different way. And Susan, your question about um, what, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but what kind of comes to mind when you think of Avalokiteshvara and letting go and then 
um, Tejo and you were talking about the hands that reach out and we're all kind of reaching for each other, um, I think helped me realize that that I think it points me back to the interconnectedness and that, you know, I'm not alone and that I'm, I don't have to do everything by myself. Um, and Tejo, I had a similar experience. Recently, I lost my keys and I was hiking with my dog, Kiku. And so I was really like, you know, they could be anywhere. <laughs> and so like, I, you know, I'm starting to, you know, I had ideas of where they were on the trail. And so I was like, you know, trying to keep myself chill and not go into like panic mind. But then I would get to that spot on the trail and they wouldn't be there. And so, you know, I'm like hyping myself up and getting more and more kind of um, just kind of panicked in my mind. Um, and we're doing, we did a whole nother lap and I'm exhausted and Kiku's exhausted. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm like calling my little sister and like, oh my gosh, you're going to have to come get me. And, you know, I realized at, at one point it was like, well, you know, I'm going to be fine because I have all this support in my life and my sister can come get me. And, call AAA and we'll get in the car. It's really, it's really going to be okay. It sucks. Um, and then I, I looked, you know, I'm like, Nicole's on her way, my little sister. And then I looked to my car and my keys were under my, one of my windshield wipers, <laughs> you know? And so I guess somebody had found them and picked them up and, and somehow knew that it was my, the keys to this car. And, yeah. uh, you know, so for me, it's like this, this, like I'm, I'm not alone and I've got a lot of support and that, yeah, that image Tejo, we're all kind of reaching for each other. And um, for me, that Avalokiteshvara, or I hear this phrase a lot, like let go and let God. Um, and I kind of would, would kind of hear that and, and, and think like jokingly, or it's, you know, kind of use it humorously but the more I recently I've been thinking about it and I'm like yeah you know that's that's really true and it's really helpful to realize that um I'm I don't have to do everything by myself and in fact I can't do everything by myself and when I let go of that everything kind of falls into place or at least I've got a lot of um people with me who are who are there and extending compassion in, in various ways. So I think of Avalokiteshvara as like almost every everything and everyone in a way. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. As you were saying that, I was realizing, you know, the whole image of holding on and letting go that we we can't reach for each other and hold out on to our own stuff at the same time uh, metaphorically at least that that letting go is reaching for each other that's very helpful thank you well i think we could go on but it's 1102 so we probably should wind it up for the day um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Susan, so much for engaging in this. Um, so let's do the um, returning the merit. May the merit of this practice May the merit. benefit all beings and bring peace. Thank you.